described himself as an economic hitman, a highly paid professional who cheated countries around the globe out of trillions of dollars. 20 years ago, Perkins began writing a book with the working title Conscience of an Economic Hitman. Perkins writes, the book was to be dedicated to the presidents of two countries, men who'd been his clients whom I respected and thought of as kindred spirits, Jaime Roldos, president of Ecuador, and Omar Torrijos, president of Panama. Both had just died in fiery crashes. Their deaths were not accidental. They were assassinated because they opposed that fraternity of corporate government and banking heads whose goal is global empire. We economic hitmen failed to bring Rolos and Torrijos around and the other type of hitmen, the CIA-sanctioned jackals who were always right behind us, stepped in. John Perkins goes on to write, I was persuaded to stop writing that book. I started it four times, four more times during the next 20 years. On each occasion, my decision to begin again was influenced by current world events. The U.S. invasion of Panama in 1980, the first Gulf War, Somalia, the rise of Osama bin Laden. However, threats or bribes always convince me to stop. But now Perkins has finally published his story. The book is called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. John Perkins joins us now in our Firehouse studio. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you, Amy. It's great to be it's here. It's good to have you with us. Okay, just explain this term, economic hitman, EHM, as you call it. Well, basically, what we were trained to do and what our job is to do is to build up the American empire, to bring, to create situations where as many resources as possible flow into this country to our corporations and our, and our government. And in fact, we've been very successful. We've built the largest empire in the history of the world. It's been done over the last uh, 50 years since World War II uh, with very little military might, actually. It's only in rare instances like Iraq where the military comes in as a last resort. This empire, unlike any other in the history of the world, has been built primarily through economic manipulation, through cheating, through fraud, through seducing people into our way of life, through the economic hitmen. Hmm. I, I was very much a part of that. How did you become one? Who did you work for? Well, I was initially recruited while I was in business school back in the late 60s by the National Security Agency, the nation's largest and least understood spy organization. But ultimately, I worked for private corporations. The first real economic hitman was back in the early 1950s, uh, Kermit Roosevelt, the grandson of Teddy, who overthrew the government of, of Iran, a democratically elected government, Mossadegh's government, who was the Times Magazine Person of the Year. and. Uh, he was so successful at doing this without any blood, well, there was a little bloodshed, but no military intervention, just spending millions of dollars, and replaced uh, Mossadegh with the Shah of Iran. Um, that at that point, we understood that this idea of economic hitman was an extremely good one. We didn't have to th have to worry about the threat of war with Russia when we did it this way. The problem with that was that that uh, Roosevelt was a CIA agent. He was a government employee. Had he been caught, uh, we would have been in a lot of trouble. It would have been very embarrassing. So at that point, the decision was made to use organizations like the CIA and the NSA to recruit potential economic hitmen like me, and then to send us to work for private consulting companies, engineering firms, construction companies, so that if we were caught, uh, there would be no, no, no connection with the government. Okay, explain the company you worked for. Well, the company I worked for was a company named Charles T. Maine in Boston, Massachusetts. We were about 2,000 employees, and I became its chief economist. I ended up having 50 people working for me. But uh, my real job was deal making. It was uh, giving loans to other countries, uh, huge loans, much bigger than they could possibly repay. And well, one of the conditions of the loan, let's say a billion dollar loan to a country like Indonesia or Ecuador. And, and this country would then have to give 90% of that loan back to a U.S. company or U.S. companies to build the infrastructure, a Halliburton or a Bechtel. These were big ones. And those companies would then go in and build an electrical system or ports or highways. And these would basically serve just a few of the very wealthiest families in those countries. The poor people in those countries would be stuck ultimately with this amazing debt that they couldn't possibly repay. A country today like Ecuador, 
Ecuador um, owes over 50% of its national budget just to pay down its, its debt. And it really can't do it. So we literally have them over a barrel. So when we want more oil, we go to Ecuador and say, look, you're, you're not able to repay your debts, therefore give our oil companies your Amazon rainforests, which are filled with oil. And today we're going in and destroying Amazonian rainforests, forcing Ecuador to give them to us because they've accumulated all this debt. So we make this big loan. Most of it comes back to the United States. The country's left with the debt, plus lots of interest, and they basically become our servants, our slaves. It's an empire. There's no two ways about it. It's a huge empire. It's been extremely successful. We're talking to John Perkins, author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman. You say because of bribes and other reasons, you didn't write this book for a long time. What do you mean? Who tried to bribe you or who? What are the bribes you accepted? Well, I accepted a half a million dollar bribe in the 90s not to write the book. From? From a, a major uh, construction engineering company. Which one? Uh, le legally speaking, it wasn't a Stoner Webster. Legally speaking, it wasn't a bribe. It was uh, that I was being paid as a consultant. This is all very legal, but I essentially did nothing. It was very understood, as I explained in Confessions of an Economic Hitman, that it was, I was, it was understood when I accepted this money as a consultant to them. I wouldn't have to do much work, but I mustn't write any books about the subject, which uh, they were aware that I was in the process of writing this book, which at the time I called uh, uh, Conscience of an Economic Hitman. And I have to tell you, Amy, that you know it's, it's an extraordinary story from the standpoint of, it's almost James Bondish, truly, and, and I mean. Uh, well, that's certainly how the book reads. Well, yeah, and it w and it was, you know, and and when the National Security Agency recruited me, they put me through a day of lie detector tests. They found out all my weaknesses and immediately um, seduced me. They used the you know the strongest drugs in our culture, sex, power, and money, to win me over. I come from a, a very old New England family, Calvinist, uh, steeped in amazingly strong moral values. Um, I think I, you know, I'm a pretty good person and overall, and I think my story really shows how this system and these powerful drugs of sex, money, and power can seduce people, because I certainly was seduced. And if I hadn't lived this life as an economic hitman, I think I'd have a, a hard time believing that anybody does these things. And that's why I wrote the book, because our country really needs to understand if people in this nation understood what our foreign policy is really about, what foreign aid is about, how our corporations work, wh where our tax money goes, I know we will demand change. We're talking to John Perkins. In your book, uh, you talk, ab talk about how you helped to implement a secret scheme uh, that funneled billions of dollars of Saudi Arabian petrodollars back into the U.S. economy, and that further cemented the intimate relationship between the House of Saud and successive U.S. administrations. Explain. Well, uh, yes, it was a fascinating time. Um, I remember well, you're probably too young to remember, but I remember well in the early 70s how OPEC uh, exercise this power it had uh, and and cut back on oil supplies. We had cars lined up at gas stations. The country was afraid that it was facing another uh, 1929 type of, of, of crash, depression, and this was unacceptable. So the, the, the Treasury Department hired me and a few other economic hitmen. We went to Saudi Arabia. We and you're actually called economic hitmen, EHM? Well, it, yeah, it was a tongue-in-cheek term that we called ourselves. I mean, officially, I was a chief economist, but, uh, you know, yeah, we call ourselves the EHMs, and it was tongue-in-cheek. It was, it was like, nobody will believe us if we say this, you know? And so we went to Saudi Arabia in the early 70s, and we, we knew Saudi Arabia w was the key to dropping our dependency to, or, or to, to controlling the situation. And we worked out this deal whereby the Royal House of Saud it, uh, agreed to send most of their petrodollars back to the United States and invest them in U.S. government securities. The Treasury Department would use the interest from these securities to hire U.S. companies to build Saudi Arabia, new cities, new infrastructure, which we've done. And the House of Saud would agree uh, to maintain the price of oil within acceptable limits to us, which they've done all these years. And we would agree to keep the House of Saud in power as long as they did this, which we've done, which is one of the reasons we went to war with Iraq in the first place. And in Iraq, we tried to implement the same policy that had been so successful in Saudi Arabia, but Saddam Hussein didn't buy. When the economic hitmen fail, 
in this scenario. The next step is what we call the jackals. Jackals are CIA-sanctioned people that come in and, and try to foment a coup or revolution. If that doesn't work, they perform assassinations or try to. In in the case of Iraq, they weren't able to get through to Saddam Hussein. He had His bodyguards were too good. He had doubles. They couldn't get through to him. So the third line of defense, if the economic hitmen and the jackals fail, the next line of defense is our young men and women who are sent in to die and kill, which is what we've obviously done in Iraq. Can you explain how Torrijos died? The Omar Torrijos, the president of, of Panama. Omar Torrijos had signed the Canal Treaty with um, uh, Carter, much in, and it, you know it passed our Congress by only one vote. It was a highly contended issue, and Torrijos then also went ahead and uh, negotiated with the Japanese to build a sea level canal. The Japanese wanted to finance and construct a sea level canal in Panama. Torrijos talk to them about this, which very much upset Bechtel Corporation, whose president was George Schultz, and senior counsel was Caspar Weinberger. When Carter was thrown out, and that's an interesting story how that actually happened, uh, when he lost the election and uh, and Reagan came in, and Schultz came in as Secretary of State from Bechtel, and Weinberger came from Bechtel to be Secretary of Defense. They were extremely angry at, at Torrijos. Uh, it tried to get him to renegotiate the Canal Treaty and not to talk to the Japanese. He adamantly refused. He was a very principled man. He had his problems, but he was a very principled man. He was an amazing man, Torrijos. Um, and so he died in a, in a fiery airplane crash, uh, which was connected to a tape recorder with explosives in it, which in, uh, I, I was there. I had been working with him. I knew that we economic hitmen had failed. I knew the jackals were closing in on him. And the next thing, his plane exploded with a tape recorder with a bomb in it. Uh, there's no question in my mind that it was CIA sanctioned, and most, uh, many Latin American investigators have come to the same conclusion. Of course, we never heard much about that in our country. So where, when did your change of heart happen? I felt guilty throughout the whole time, but I was seduced. The power of these drugs, sex, power and, and money was extremely strong for me. And of course I was doing things I was being patted on the back for. I was chief economist. I was doing things that uh, Robert McNamara liked and so on. But How closely I, did you work with the World Bank? Uh, very, very closely with the World Bank. The World Bank provides most of the money that's used by economic hitmen, it and the, it and the IMF. But when 9-11 struck, I had a change of heart. I knew the story had to be told because what happened at 9-11 is a direct result of what the economic hitmen are doing. And the only way that we're going to feel secure in this country again and that we're going to feel good about ourselves is if we use these systems we put into place to create positive change around the world. I really believe we can do that. I believe the World Bank and other institutions can be turned around and, and do what they were originally intended to do, which is help reconstruct devastated parts of the world, help genuinely help poor people. There are, there are 24,000 people starving to death every day. We can change that. John Perkins, I want to thank you very much for being with us. Uh, John Perkins' book is called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. That does it for today's program.